Hello, everyone. Um, so welcome to our session today. Uh, it's titled Culturally Responsive Practice and Participatory Curriculum, uh, specifically in ABE. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're so excited about this morning's session. Uh, my name is Erin Carey. I'm the Associate Director and an ELL instructor for Lindale Education Program in South Minneapolis, and my pronouns are she and her. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Ishu Chen. I am the Learning Center's Manager at Literacy Minnesota. My pronouns are she and her. Uh, thanks for being in the session. Uh, we're going to go through a lot of content. Um, so you might have a lot of questions. Uh, feel free to chat them out. I uh, will do our best to try to answer them um, as the presentation goes. Um, otherwise, uh, we might uh, have to wait until the end if we have time to, to respond to some of them. So some of the key takeaways today. Uh, expand understanding of culture and its impact on teaching and learning. Learn the history behind and understand the mindset that promotes culturally responsive practice in the classroom. Consider the benefits of structuring ABE classroom around learning partnerships or alliances. And become familiar with participatory ABE curriculum unit toolkit that Erin had created. So what is culture? Chat it out. Um, your notions of it, don't wiki it, uh, don't look up the definition on the internet, just based on your understanding of culture, what is it? What's it about? Chat it out. Norms, family background, values, mm -hmm. language, traditions, family traditions, foods, common mores that are shared broadly across the society, deeply held beliefs, um, ways of thinking, acting, the life of any individual person, everyday lifestyle, custom traditions, values, uh, systems of values and traditions, physical similarities, community and family, practice um, and form routines, a lot of really, really great ideas here. Customs and values and beliefs, attitudes, connotations, ethnic, so ethnicity, experiences within one community. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Yes, these are all aspects of culture. So we really wanna look what's beneath the surface of culture. Um, you know, that you provided a lot of uh, definitions, both surface and deep. Um, so I really like this model, this tree model of um, culture. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the iceberg model of culture where, you know, um, you see the, the surface culture or the tip of the iceberg, which is visible to the naked eye, um, is like the traditions and the food and the language. And beneath the surface is the majority of the iceberg. So these are the the things that are unseen, um, more implicit versus explicit. But what I like about this model um, that's used in Zaretta Hammond's uh, book, Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain, which we will be referring to a lot in this presentation, um, is this tree model because um, I like to think about, and she does as well, uh, culture as a living ecosystem, something that changes over time, something that's dynamic, and really depending on nature and society and what's what's happening around. Um, so you see service culture at the top. So this is the fruit, this is the leaves. Um, this is observable cultural practices taking form of food, clothes, um, stories, holidays, cooking. Um, so a lot of you have listed that as well. So beneath that, so this is the trunk and the branches. So this is shallow culture. So these are unspoken rules um, and cultural rules. So someone actually did mention cultural rules as a form of culture, um, such as nonverbal communication, um, ideas of space, personal boundaries, eye contact. In some cultures, when you look directly at someone's eyes, that's a form of hostility. So when I worked with native children, 
um, in the past at the last school I worked at, um, it was a form of hostility to look at them in the eyes. And I would hear teachers consistently say, look at me in the eyes and show me respect. You did something disrespectful, look at me in the eyes. And it was a form of, for them, intimidation, because um, culturally that was um, seen as very aggressive. Um, but in, our, in Western culture, it's seen as disrespectful when you don't look at someone in the eyes. Um, so on and so forth. And at the bottom there is a the root system. So these are really deeply entrenched um, ideologies um, or paradigms. Um, so this is what Jung calls like a collective unconscious. Um, so ideas of decision making, relationship to nature, um, let's see, justice, uh, definitions of kinship and group identity. And I can even say maybe um, ideologies such as patriarchy and capitalism and white supremacy also belong in the root system of societies. Uh, does anyone have any questions about this model? What I like about this model is that it's uh, it shows culture in layers. You know, it's not uh, just the surface observable things that we can see um, like on the outside. Um, and um, just thinking also about uh, as educators, how it's really important to understand conceptualizations of culture, not just through the surface or shallow, but um, through deep culture in order to navigate relationships with students, with each other um, in nuanced ways and appropriate ways. Um, because if you think about any political debate or a really emotionally charged debate, it's really in the root system. It's, it's, it's from our beliefs, our deep beliefs. And Ishu, uh, I was noticing too when, uh, so uh, Ishu prom prompted me to read Hammond's book um, when we were discussing this presentation, I learned so much and uh, where it's uh, describing each layer of culture and, and talks about the impact on trust of the different layers. Um, I had kind of a moment where I was thinking about this ongoing discussion and learning that we're having around microaggressions and how um, somebody from another group may comment on another person's clothes or hair and something that may have, you know, a surface um, uh, impact on your ability to trust that person. However, they're revealing something deep, um, maybe about their own worldview, their own ideas about um, how people um, belong to groups and, and how there's an otherness maybe between those two individuals. And that was a big revelation for me about why microaggressions may be so hurtful. Yeah, yeah, I did a presentation on microaggressions. And uh, similarly, I used a tree model to demonstrate where microaggressions are coming from. So the microaggressions you can think of as the, the leaves. Um, these are the comments and the slights that come out of people's mouths. And um, that's connected to institutions, you know, that like criminal justice or education um, that really um, reinforce those ideas, but really truly rooted in like patriarchy and heteronormativity and capitalism and sexism and racism. Um, and so you see that in the, in the root system and where people's unconscious bias lies. We had a comment asking for the name of the book by Hammond. It's, it is in our resources later, so you'll get like a, a full citation, um, but I did chat it out. It's Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain. So uh, culturally responsive practice, what is it? Um, so this was a term that was coined by Gloria Ladson Billings, who is a scholar in education, um, multicultural education. I'll be talking a little bit more about her um, different conceptualizations of this later, but what it isn't, uh, which a lot of people kind of like get it twisted a little bit, it's not a bag of twi tricks. It's not, you know, if you came to this session thinking that you would get like XYZ technique to implement in the classroom space um, so that you can connect better with learners, um, that's not really what this session is about. It's really thinking about culturally responsive practice as a 
um, mindsets. It's a way of, it's a philosophy rather, um, around organizing instruction to allow for flexibility in teaching. Um, so it's a pedagogy which sees the importance of including learners' cultural references in all aspects of learning. Um, so it's really a lot about uh, reflection, personal reflection on the part of the educator, as well as thinking a little bit more deeply about where learners are coming from and, and um, kind of their mindsets and their agency as well. Um, and not just like, you know, if I um, bring some to the class one day, like I'll definitely win them over, which, you know, I think it's a really nice gesture, but it's not necessarily going to be, um, you know, the only thing that uh, you should do necessarily. <laughs> so. The banking model of education, folks may have heard of this before. Um, this was um, a term popularized by um, the educator, uh, Paulo Freire, who we will talk about um, briefly later. Um, but the, the basic idea being, and you can see it illustrated here, that the teacher uh, is an expert who um, fills the students' brains and that the students are passive recipients of this knowledge. So obviously this is very dehumanizing to students and sees them as a vessel for knowledge, very passive, very uncritical within the process. The students are seen as dependent on an instructor who is the expert instead of being an active participant in their own education, being a collaborator in their education and becoming increasingly independent, uh, bringing a lot to the process of their own education. And of course, through the title, you can also see that it, a banking model is a critique of viewing educational policy and practices um, through a capitalistic lens. Thank you. Um, and yeah, we will be talking a little bit more about where the origins of banking model come from, which uh, Aaron had mentioned, uh, Paulo Freire, um, Brazilian educator. So just going back to the foundations of culturally responsive practice. So there's three and they're all inter interdependent and um, not one is um, higher than the other. They're all equally important, um, but really, foundational to having um, sound culturally responsive practice in the classroom. So that's academic rigor, social political consciousness, as well as cultural competency. So um, in terms of social political consciousness, um, you know, some people might find it surprising, but the field of adult basic education, not necessarily as an institution, but as a movement began um, to liberate um, people basically from their oppressive conditions of life, whether that's from oppressive governments, um, oppressive um, workplaces, um, poverty, illiteracy. Um, and so this idea that um, education is really to empower folks to step into their own agency and realize their own power so that they can transform their own lives and the conditions of their lives and to um, gain literacy and different things. So um, Paulo Freire called it uh, reading the word to read the world. So um, using education to be able to think more critically about the conditions of the reality. Um, academic rigor. So this is really important and really, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but stepping away from the deficit model of thinking of learners and, and students um, and having high expectations is something that's really important um, to, to having like really student-centered approach, like really understanding what are the goals and of the individual a learner and um, creating an alliance with them to meet those goals and keeping them um, accountable to, to their own goals. Um, is I think really affirming and really important. Um, cultural competency. So this word has shifted over time. Some people might call it cultural attunement, cultural humility, um, but basically it's the idea that educators are taking uh, responsibility of um, informing themselves about the cultural uh, practices uh, of their students, the cultures that they come from. And not only that, but interrogating their own 
um, cultural beliefs and identities and privileges. Um, I think it's very normal, especially in um, a white dominant society to think that, um, you know, an edu a white educator might not have a culture. But yes, uh, we all have culture. We all come from culture. Uh, none of us are acultural. Um, we all have root beliefs and ideologies um, and values. So it's really important to kind of um, interrogate and to understand them as well in the, in the way that it impacts um, us and, and other people. Um, so, you know, using cultural students' cultures um, as a basis for learning and engaging with them in a dynamic power sharing way. So here are some tenets of culturally responsive practice. Um, examine Ill, implicit bias. Um, most of you have been to an implicit bias training. Um, if you haven't, sort of like diversity, equity, inclusion training that talks about implicit bias as um, just not really explicit, but more subliminal unconscious ways that we form judgments about other people um, or other groups outside our own group. Um, and so uh, this is a way that our brains, as Zareta Hammond um, talks about in her book, processes information um, and creates shortcuts in the forms of stereotypes. So that's kind of where stereotypes come from. It's a way for us to make sense of the world and, and not have to really think deeply about and reflect ourselves um, and maybe ways that we might be uh, oppressive. <laughs> um, and so we do this to feel comfortable. Um, so in challenging our biases, it makes you vulnerable to attack, but it's not really going to make you unsafe, but really forces you to really just challenge the status quo. Um, so have a asset-based mindset versus a deficit-based mindset. This is very, very important. Um, you know, there's a lot of folks maybe in the field of education in general, K-12, higher ed, uh, what have you, ABE, who might have this kind of savior mentality that, you know, I'm here to give back. But um, what it sometimes leads to is this idea that um, the people who you serve are your learners, um, uh, you know, you wheel them through a deficit viewpoint, um, which I don't think is very healthy for anyone. Uh, Resma Manakin, he's a he local healer. Um, he does a lot of stuff around trauma. He talks about how collect collective trauma is sometimes seen as uh, mistaken for culture. So for example, in our society, we hear it even with politicians, like our last commander in chief calls Mexicans rapists and criminals. Um, so we really pathologize other people. Um, and we will say that poverty is a culture, for example, poverty is not a culture. Um, and so sometimes we pathologize, pathologize other communities as lazy, criminal, or violent. Um, you know, I've heard several times um, people say, yeah, the English is not good enough, but how can you flip that mindset and instead of saying that um, not having um, the same English skills maybe as you is a deficit versus maybe saying instead, hey, this individual speaks five languages already. Like they're on their way to, like they have a foundation for learning another language. They've shown that they can. Um, so just kind of flipping that thinking. Um, so acknowledge and uplift learners' funds of knowledge. We'll talk about funds of knowledge in a bit. Have high expectations. Um, contextualize learning. So, um, we call this also culturally mediated. Um, so think about um, having in the curriculum diverse way, presenting diverse ways of thinking, um, images um, that are relatable to learners and share power in the classroom. We'll talk about different ways that you can share power, um, but just think a little bit and examine um, how power is played out in the classroom. Um, and also it's relationship focused. So the relationship between teacher and learner is congruent with culture of students. So what are the boundaries of students? So like setting boundaries, um, you know, how do you uh, set up a safe space um, so that learners feel comfortable in that space, whether it's with each other 
are with you. Um, so yeah, just think about those things. So why culturally responsive practice? Um, so honor learners' identities. So when learners feel affirmed and seen in, um, it facil facilitates safety, therefore learning can happen. Um, so when people are consistently in, like their parasympathetic or sympathetic um, nervous system is activated, they're not able to learn because they're always in survival mode. They're always, um, and I've seen this actually in schools, especially with youth um, who experience a lot of uh, trauma um, in their life. Um, they're consistently in fight or flight mode. They're not able to learn. Um, and thinking about how to either evade or get out of a situation or um, be combative. Um, because they just don't feel safe. Um, so it's really important to um, make pe people feel affirmed. It promotes equity and inclusion in the classroom, uh, increases learner engagement in the classroom and material. Um, there's a whole field, I'm not super familiar, but there's a movement of ethnic studies um, around really engaging people through the learning of their own ancestry and their own identities. Um, and even others' identities in, in critical ways that are not um, seen through like a white lens or the white gaze, but um, just through really empowering ways. So ethnic studies is a form of um, engagement in classroom material. Um, and support critical thinking or independent learning. Um, I think this is really important. Uh, Hammond talks a lot about the difference between dependent learning and independent learning. Um, so independent learners use their own devices to process and tackle new tasks, has strategies to get unstuck, uh, can retrieve long-term memory versus dependent learners who um, might depend on the teacher to carry the cognitive load, um, can't complete tasks without scaffold, um, and might sit passively until the teacher comes to help or ask consistently if they're on track. Um, so, uh, you know, this, this is one reason why we really support culturally responsive practice. Are there um, any questions so far about any of this? Sorry, I'm kind of zooming by this. I know we're on a time crunch. Um, so this is a Hmong story map actually at the bottom. Um, so yeah, if you want to know more, just Okay. So just a little bit about the history of culturally responsive teaching as part of adult education. Um, the popular education movement, um, which um, was uh, originated in the 20th century in South America, um, popular here is meant in the sense of, um, of the people. So really targeted toward uh, or supporting poor people, working class people, uh, and putting educators and learners in dialogue. Uh, and it's founded on the principle that when social conditions oppress people, education can never be neutral. Uh, or if it is new considered neutral, it sides with the oppressor. So, the goal of popular education or education in general must be to raise social consciousness in general across both uh, learners and educators and to connect social problems uh, to the life circumstances of the individual, um, which leads to individual liberation, uh, increased self-sufficiency and independence, uh, and also the, the power to sort of change some of those oppressive circumstances. So there's a, a collective liberation that happens. Um, and again, this um, is was popularized by Paulo Freire, who we will talk about. Um, and uh, yeah, was um, a form of education and organizing uh, starting in Latin America that expanded across the world, particularly among the working class and farmers. 
Thanks, Karen. Uh, Aaron, I combined your name. <laughs> Karen, Karen. Um, yes, like popular, I think it's really important to understand that adult education and a um, popular education. You should work. We're having you cut in and out. Maybe if you shut off your video. Can you hear me here now? Yeah, it's a little better. Okay. Um, did you want to talk about legislation? And I'll I'll try to think about my computer. Sure. So, um, 1966, we had the Adult Education Act. Um, it was a follow up to the Economic Opportunity Act um, of 1964. And um, let me get back into presenting here. Um, in 1964, um, federal adult basic education programming was established. Before then, it had been a concern from state to state. Um, and in 66, uh, we had the Adult Education Act that um, was created as a federal intervention uh, in adult ed to provide state directors to each state to sort of professionalize the field and, of course, provide funding uh, across the US for professional development and, and training of teachers, uh, specifically for adult ed. And the stated purpose was to improve the economic conditions of adults um, who were in need of educational services and to encourage school completion, at least through the high school level. Um, but it also had the impact of defining or framing the field of adult basic education by economic concerns and tying it to workforce development, um, which uh, it, I, I think we can agree that many learners have these goals, but it uh, as a framing device for the way that um, we have accountability um, to funders in our field, it can be problematic in the sense that we uh, may be viewing our learners uh, within that framework first. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, and as uh, Aaron, can you all hear me better now? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, as Aaron's explaining, you know, the way that uh, popular education, we, we want to show that, you know, popular education was a movement that was organic from the bottom up and very much about um, focus on liberation, especially for poor and working people around the world. Um, it spread basically from Brazil to many, many nations around the world. Um, you know, to fight back against um, colonial powers and colonialism, authoritarian governments, um, poor working conditions. Um, and it kind of became more institutionalized and co-opted by uh, this legislation that um, made it an institution um, which was really tied to standards and um, professionalized in the way that it wasn't before. Um, so the Highlander Folk School is a really great example of how um, CRT existed within the U.S. Um, context. Um, it started in Tennessee and uh, was founded in the 30s in the midst of the Great Depression and really provided training and education to movement leaders. So in the 50s, a lot of uh, the civil rights leaders and labor organizers came from this tradition of the Highlander Folk School. It still exists. I would love to go there. <laughs> Um, they've done a lot of organizing around environmental and health justice for under-resourced communities in Appalachia. Okay. So uh, here he is, uh, Paulo Freire. Uh, he is, or he was a Brazilian educator and activist. Um, so I think anyone in the field of adult education needs to read this. Um, his focus was on adult education and especially literacy. Um, he coined the term conscientital, I hope I got it right, a critical consciousness to describe a pedagogy that aims to liberate both the oppressed and the oppressor. Um, so this is a developmental process where the individual moves from naive thinking to critical social consciousness. So his framework was very much about power sharing, about using 
uh, literacy or um, becoming literate in order to for poor people, working people to realize the realities of their life. Um, learning was contextualized. So people weren't just learning like um, about lat like old, I don't know, Greek culture. They were contextualizing their um, education and they were having dialogue. So this is a huge component of flair, like the Freirian model is around dialogue and um, having like these conversation circles um, so that people could share ideas with each other. Um, and so he's kind of really central, a huge central figure in, in culturally relevant pedagogy and um, like this kind of liberate, like education for liberation. Um, yeah, so definitely read, read the pedagogy of the oppressed. Um, when I read it, when I lived abroad, um, I was serving in Peace Corps in Madagascar. I, I read it for the first time and it was really life-changing for me. Um, a lot of things clicked in my mind, I think at that point. Um, I had a lot of naive quote unquote quote, thinking about the world and um, it kind of made me understand a little bit more about the social conditions of the people I lived with at that time, as well as um, of my family and the uh, oppression that had happened to my own family. My grandma was um, prevented from going to school um, when she was very young uh, during the Japanese occupation and uh, she never learned how to read or write. And, um, I think that has a huge impact on the reason why I'm in education today. Okay. So a historical example of this, Malcolm X. All right, so um, he, for some reason, is a very, um, I guess, um, I don't know, he's a figure that evokes a lot of strong emotions in people, I guess, whether it's negative or positive um, for various reasons. But I think this is a really great example of um, what um, Paulo Freire calls like consciousness raising or conscience itself. Um, if you read his, the autobiography of Malcolm X by Alex Haley, he really documents the process of becoming conscious and critically conscious. Um, so Malcolm X, he grew up in poverty. He grew up amongst a lot of racial violence. Um, and he, because of his social conditions and economic conditions, he fell into um, a lot of crime um, and committed some crime and that ended him in jail. And um, at that point, he um, met someone who was in the Nation of Islam um, and then he started to do a lot of um, reflection and a lot of reading and um, came to the understanding of his own social realities and economic realities, um, realities that oppressed him. And he became a, really an advocate for black liberation in, in this country and ultimately, ultimately was killed for it. Um, yeah, I was just listening to a speech by him yesterday, and it literally gave me chills up my spine. It's um, it's a speech where he talks about um, like, who taught you to hate the texture of your hair? Who taught you to hate the sh um, shape of your nose, uh, the width of your lips? Um, who ta taught you to hate yourself? And he was much so much about um, self love and uplifting. Um, you know, his community um, and making people realize the negative messages that they um, internalized because of white supremacy. Um, so yeah, read, read that out of the biography, it's good. Absolutely. So funds of knowledge. Um, so this is the idea that people are competent and have knowledge and that their life experiences have given them that knowledge um, so instruction should be linked to students' lives and details of effective pedagogy should be linked to local histories and community contexts. Um, so the funds of knowledge approach fosters a powerful way to represent communities in terms of resources they possess um, and how to harness them in the classroom teaching. So this is um, Gonzalez and Mall and Monty were really key in 
uh, defining this um, idea of funds of knowledge. Um, thank you, Lindsay. So Lindsay left a module that you can actually use in the classroom um, to explore funds of knowledge of learners. Um, so what are we talking about? So these, so rather than thinking of what your learners don't have, think about what they come into classroom with. So this is their traditions and values, um, their knowledge of farming, of land, of nature, of cooking and healing practices, of language and culture, their ideas of economics. Um, you know, when I was um, in Africa, like there was a group of people I lived with that really um, centered their lives on barter and trade. And so, you know, and was really much about uh, cooperative economics. So really formed their lives um, counter to kind of this capitalistic model that uh, we have in the US. Um, so this is a picture of a postpartum soup that people eat in China um, after they give birth for one month, um, women are ex women who give birth or people who give birth are um, expected to kind of just sit and to heal. Um, and so this is um, just a tradition that I think is very different than in the US. When I first gave birth my son, um, you know, we call it uh, so you sit for a month basically um, and the mother gets mothered. So in the US, it's very different. You know, we're expected to um, get back on our feet so soon after giving birth. Um, we're expected to be independent right after um, that we should be losing weight, all that baby weight. Um, you know, there was so many ads I got about how to lose all that baby weight. Um, but this idea is very counter to that. So um, I think it's, a, it's an asset, I think, having these cultural values. Um, so think, just think about the values that you're, and the different knowledges that your students bring into the classroom. So we had planned to do a couple breakouts in this session. Um, however, there is so, so much to talk about um, that we're behind on our time. So we will have time to break out and talk in groups, but I think we're going to just do one instead of two. Um, but we encourage you as part of your um, practice and, and um, starting to look into the process of culturally responsive teaching um, to talk um, of course, reflect yourself and talk with colleagues um, in the future. And you can bring this into uh, the breakout we'll have shortly. Um, think about who are the people in your classroom? What are their languages and literacies that they bring with them? What funds of knowledge do they bring with them? Uh, what are their objectives when they come to English class? What are they looking for from the experience? And how can you collaborate um, on that together? Um, so Marisa and Lindsay, I think we're gonna we're going to skip this breakout and just um, have one um, a little bit later. Yeah, so I'm just gonna quickly go over this. Um, I think it's really important to think about um, building learning partnerships or alliances with your learners, um, and so. The reason that uh, this actually comes from Zreda Hammond's book, uh, she talks about building alliances, and this comes from Aaron, um, I believe his name is uh, Eric Bodine, or Edward mm -hmm. Bodine. Um, he was a therapist um, who coined this um, term, uh, building a therapeutic alliance with his clients. So this idea that um, an educator should really think about um, the the needs and the goals of their learners and to be attuned to them um, and to help them reach their goals. Um, and so uh, affirmation and validation are really important. Um, so some examples of this um, is highlighting individual achievements, staying away from stereotypes, showing appreciation of their culture and language. So build trust the pedagogy of listening. Um, so yeah, hold space for difficult uh, conversations. 
and you can do this virtually. You can integrate personal check-ins and warm-ups um, in the remote environment. A lot of you are still working remotely. Um, so this fosters a more democratic um, relationship with learners, um, empathy and understanding, and just helps you to be more attuned to particular needs of learners and communicates respect when you can really listen to people. Um, so this one's really important, uh, become a warm demander. Um, so a warm demander, so that also means showing care. So it's important to set high expectations, but in, but in a safe environment, a safe supportive environment to promote learning. So you wanna combine personal warmth or care with acting demandedness or high expectations. Um, so it doesn't mean that you should be authoritarian and really strict, but that, that as an educator, you can really push your learners to stretch beyond the comfort zone to reach excellence. Um, and you can do this by showing care and personal warmth. Um, so if you show care and personal warmth, that really kind of gives you more of a right to be uh, a demander or um, to be a warm demander, if that makes sense. Um, let's see. All right, I think it's all yours, Erin. Thank you. Okay, so building on this idea of uh, how do we create learning partnerships across the classroom, we're back to our friend Paulo Freire. Um, this was a quote that became very important to me uh, in the, the project that I'm about to show you. Um, the central problem is this, how can the oppressed participate in developing the pedagogy of their own liberation? This is from the book we mentioned, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. So um, as part of my capstone for my MAESL at Hamlin a couple of years ago, I um, put together a participatory ABE curriculum unit toolkit. This is something that teachers can use to create units uh, in collaboration with their learners. Um, so if you want to enter in the chat um, a response to this question, what do you think of as the purpose of adult education or as we call it adult basic education? Go ahead and put your thoughts in the chat. Mm, people are thinking about it. <laughs> what is the purpose of adult basic education? Sure. A place for resources for our students, okay. Mm -hmm. Assisting students in reaching their academic personal goals, attain their goals, provide opportunities work with learners to meet their goals, empower others through learning, place for growth, uh, equip and enable language learners, uh, offer learners the opportunity to realize their plans and dreams, empowerment, mm -hmm. a lot of, yeah, supporting students uh, in their goals, right? Setting goals and reaching them, encouraging self-worth, mm -hmm. improving communication abilities, provide more e equality and pushback against oppression, okay, yeah to be a support instructor, empower and an opportunity to use what they know to new knowledge. Mm -hmm. Learn English, get a job. Yeah, so this was a question that was really um, central for me um, when I was thinking about this toolkit. Uh, I uh, was researching a lot of the things that we spoke about earlier in terms of the history of adult education. Um, and I came to this idea of creating a, a toolkit where we could get input from learners as to what they, uh, what their purpose of adult education was in their lives. Um, part of the process included in the toolkit is stepping back to reflect and consider the purpose of the field and how we can be accountable to that purpose. So that was, th this was a question I was asking myself. What's the, pur the purpose of adult education? Uh, a central purpose, as a lot of people mentioned, is to facilitate learners' independence and ability to advocate for themselves in the workplace, in higher education, and in the community. Um, however, there are all of these things that we are accountable to as teachers, as administrators, as professionals in adult basic education, um, that um, these demands, I think, end up becoming kind of a lens through which we view our profession. Uh, we have uh, recently, just recently, 
two new assessments to prepare learners for. We have a new CASAS version and a new TABE version that we're getting acclimated to. Um, we have to be aligned to three sets of federal and state content standards. And there are lots of stakeholder expectations um, for us in how we provide our services around employment, level gains, grant deliverables, and many other things that we're accountable to. Um, and so I think sometimes we lose that centralized uh, view of students being um, the, the driver and the, the why, um, the purpose of why we're here, and sometimes are, are always thinking in terms of um, how we can meet these accountability measures. But of course, and I say this not expecting that people don't know it already, the people in our classrooms are of course not valued by their productive profit or their return on a financial investment from a, a grantor or from um, a government. Uh, our students' worth is inherent and it is their goals that need to be centralized in the work that we're doing. So my goal with creating this curriculum unit toolkit um, was to bring that perspective uh, centrally to the process of designing our units. So you can see all of the pieces of the toolkit here. The first is a teacher's guide and it has uh, an overview of uh, all of these other pieces and explains their purpose and when and how they can be used. So overall, this toolkit is a set of resources prepared for us as ABE educators to design curriculum units that do employ ABE best practices for instruction, uh, do meet standards, do meet assessment requirements, but most importantly, for adult educational purposes, they feature objectives that are based on learner input that help learners achieve their personal goals. And uh, these tools are devised with the intention of building on these learner stated goals to further their independence, to further their facility uh, for self-advocacy. So um, after the teacher's guide, there is a teacher reflection on learner self-advocacy. There is a uh, very importantly, a learner input gathering lesson plan. And I will go through each of these tools. Uh, there's a unit design tool template a blank template that you can use to create your unit based on the learner input. And then um, a lesson plan template to bring it down to the lesson plan level from week to week or day to day. And uh, a post-teaching unit evaluation and reflection so that we can look back on uh, what worked in the unit, what, to, what, what can be improved for the next time it's used or for the next um, participatory unit. And then a glossary of terms that come up throughout these different tools. So I will quickly show you, hopefully it comes up here. There's the teacher's guide. Um, and you can just see, um, got our lovely quote there at the beginning and an explanation. And then um, all of the other tools are linked here. So you can see the teacher reflection, when can it be used? What's, a, what's the description? a few suggestions for implementation, and that follows for each of the pieces of the toolkit. So you can get to the tools through this teacher's guide, and you can also get a little bit of context around them. Sorry, I'm trying to get back to my tab here. Well, you guys, Zoom. Then we have the, um, the first tool being a teacher reflection on learner self-advocacy. So how can we plan curriculum units that put these learners self-identified goals first? How can we allow them to self-determine, self-regulate and reflect, which are terms that come out of um, uh, research on um, curriculum design. Um, and some of this comes from um, the backwards uh, curriculum design of uh, Wiggins and McTie. Um, some questions that you can ask yourself before you start planning, what does learner self-advocacy look like in action? How can ABE instructors help facilitate stronger self-advocacy skills in their learners? How do you like to do this through your instruction or what other methods would you like to try that you haven't previously worked toward uh, self-advocacy goals in your instruction? Um, so uh, that tool, 
creates a format for you to, to reflect on those questions. And that's something you can do in a staff meeting or you can do individually or with a colleague. Then we move on to probably um, the most critical tool I, as I view it in the toolkit, which is the learner input gathering lesson plan. Um, and this has multiple steps I'll just walk through quickly. So um, you're in the classroom with your learners and this is um, designed for um, intermediate students, but I have suggestions for how to level down, level up with the, with the um, students it's aimed for. Um, so we do a warm up activity. What is a unit? What do we do together in a class that constitutes a unit? Um, you'll do some review of, um, of units and maybe um, create um, this uh, activity, which you would probably recreate using units that you had recently done with students. Here, I just have some examples of common ones. And there's an activity like this where you can either cut these up into um, the units and uh, go over them, or you could um, have the students just write on a worksheet with all of these together, and they can rank them in order of importance or level of interest that they have relevance of these topics to their lives. Then for the introduction modeling part of the, of the uh, lesson, what do students come to our class to learn? So you do some activities uh, with small groups, sharing out to the whole group, do some discussion around this question. Why do you come to class? What are you trying to, um, to take away from this experience? What is useful or helpful to you? Uh, and then I have a, a mind map organizer, which students will do as sort of a, a wheel. You'll, you can uh, look at, at the lesson plan and get the full picture of it, but you can see the question is central. And then we will uh, list some responses around the, the first wheel space around this question. Um, the students, uh, you can do it as a whole class uh, on this graphic organizer and the students can take notes on their own version of that. Um, then for some guided and independent practice, when and where do you need to use these skills that you come to class to learn? So what are the different contexts where you're, you're in need of those expanding those skills? Brainstorm as a whole group. The students, again, take notes on in the outer part of this, this um, mind map and they'll be associating uh, different skills um, across, the, across the mind map and sort of making it into a, a wheel of connected ideas. Um, and then the students will vote for the top two to three um, areas of interest and need that they want to come up with. So perhaps you got like four or five different um, major topics and contexts where students need the need to apply the knowledge, you would vote for a consensus of two to three top choices. And then the students will um, think about activities that they would practice in this unit to be more independent in their lives. So what is an example of, um, of, of one of these ideas? What would it look like in class? What would we need to actually practice in a concrete way? Um, the groups would, uh, the students would go into small groups and prepare a small presentation of what they think this unit could look like. Um, and this can be done very simply, or it could be done in a more elaborate way with a lot more prompting and support. Um, but you would also share with them a rubric that they can rate each other's presentations and take some notes on what they notice in, in what, the, what the other groups present. Uh, and then they uh, will vote for some of their top choices uh, if time, you could come up with some I can objectives that could come come out of those units. Um, there's a lot more detail provided in the lesson plan itself, so um, I don't want to be super reductive about it. But this is just a little overview of that. Um, then we have um, I have a unit design tool, and I'll just show you briefly. So you can take what your students vote on as the the next unit or two that they want to work on. And then we have a format to um, put it together. So you'll transfer um, and you'll do some backwards design. So you can see what are the results, help start to create some objectives, what standards could you apply in these cases? Um, how can you help 
you know, integrate some CASAS and TABE preparation into that. Um, and then how will students show evidence that they are moving towards these desired results? What will that look like? And then developing a learning plan based on what you would like them to ultimately, what activities will lead toward um, building up evidence or demonstration of their learning. And then this leads to a overall curriculum plan that you can create objectives and list out ways that you will align it to standards and testing, vocabulary, materials, et cetera. So some of these are standard backwards design unit expectations, but we do um, want to center the learner's input and goals in those. And then there's a lesson plan template that is blank that you can create daily lessons based on that. And I'll let you look at that in your own time so we get time to talk. Uh, any quick questions before we get a chance to talk in groups? I'm not looking at the chat, so if somebody can share any questions. Not seeing anything at the moment, Erin. Okay, great. Well, people are welcome to follow up with me um, if you do. And we do, we'll have a link to this toolkit. It's very easy to access. Um, so let's go into our um, breakout time. We have about 10 minutes total to talk in groups of, of three or four. And uh, the question we'll have in the chat is in what ways could you structure your teaching mindset and practices around opportunities for learner, students to be learning partners? So this could be related to the curriculum toolkit that I shared. This could be related to some of the other things that Ishu and I were sharing earlier about um, ways to sort of um, uh, bring learners and instructors into a partnership in the classroom. Um, so I, uh, We'll give you about 10 minutes to talk and reflect together. All right. Um, just to mention, somehow my slides got mixed up and I didn't get to share the last couple tools in my toolkit here. So I'll just briefly mention those. Um, the, the fifth tool is a, a post unit evaluation. So once you've taught your learner input informed unit, then you get a chance to reflect and um, look at parts of it and I, I won't click on it because you know you guys can um, you're wanting to move on to the next part of your day but um, I'm uh, excited to my emails all over the toolkit and at the end of the session so I'd be thrilled to talk to you about it more uh, and then there's also a glossary of terms so if you're going through the tools and you're like what is this or what is this again I used to know um, <laughs> there are uh, some terms explained as part of the toolkit so looks like this for each tool there are some terms pulled out and explained um, so finally um, you can see our emails up here in the top right corner um, i hope you had a wonderful chance to reflect on learner partnerships and some of the other questions we brought up in the session i know it's a lot to unpack and we were just saying next time we present this it needs to be a much longer session or maybe two sessions uh, but we can't wait to continue that work um, so uh, some, some credit to our, uh, the amazing Minneapolis-based artist who um, is featured in the first uh, slide, Citation for Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Freire, um, the resource um, from which um, Yishu was talking about funds of knowledge. Here's a, another text you can read that really explains it in depth. A citation for the Zaretta Hammond book, which it sounds like a lot of people are familiar with, which is so exciting. Um, and then a, a link to the uh, ABE curriculum toolkit. And I know Lindsay is uh, sharing out um, a link to that, um, that module that Yishu talked about, um, about how to bring the, the funds of knowledge idea into your classroom. Uh, and then a, a toolkit, a link to the toolkit. So you can either go to this bit.ly link uh, and find all the resources. If you go to the teacher's guide, they're all linked within there too. Or you can go to the IMABE website under curricula and you will see it right there. Um, and yeah, everything's available. Uh, so we really want to thank everyone for your attention today. We know that we were, uh, we had a lot to share. Um, any other questions before we head out into the morning here? Yeah, thank you all so much for your time. 
Um, and yeah, we hope that you use some of these resources that we shared in your classroom um, for your own, I guess, um, reflection as well as educators, as people in ABE. Um, and please feel free to reach out to any one of us. Um, our emails are listed at the top of uh, this page or this slide. So um, yeah, I know we glossed through a lot, um, a very short amount of time, but uh, we hope you got something out of the session. So thank you. Thanks so much to our presenters.